for this episode. This is kind of a broad topic. It's kind of a large topic with a lot of different subtopics and, and different categories in it. But I'm going to try to focus on this list here that I've created. Uh, these are just different things that people think of as being extraordinary or out of the natural realm, something that's not natural. And then I have some things that are truly like unnatural things, but I have some things in it that are things that people think are unnatural, but are natural. So and I'll explain it as I go along. So it'll make more sense as we go through this list. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a list of stuff that I've come up with. There's a lot more other stuff out there. A lot more uh, extraordinary things. Or at least things that people think are extraordinary. I'm very skeptical when it comes to extraordinary things and things like miracles. Except all the extraordinary things that happened in the Bible. Those things I do believe 100%. I believe every single miracle that happened in the Bible actually took place in reality. And those were actual demonstration of God's power in uh, reality. So the miracles that Jesus did, those happened 100%. I'm not denying those. I'm not skeptical at all about those. But I am skeptical in things that people say are extraordinary in the world today or after uh the early the early church period so so what the apostles what the disciples did what the apostles did those miracles 100 percent did happen but everything after that i'm very skeptical or i don't believe in some of the things that people say are extraordinary or supernatural so and i'll make my case for that as we go along as well and as I talk about some of these different uh, topics here. And uh, so f and as you can see for this episode, there's actually something to look at now. So I got some feedback saying that, you know, people wanted something to look at. So you're going to be looking at my screen. And I do have some links here to some different definitions and different things like that, that I'll be pulling up. As we go along talking about these different topics and so the way that I've divided this is well the, the actual list itself is not in a specific order it's just different stuff that came to my mind but I do have a kind of a category uh, four different categories and so those categories are right here I'll zoom in so you guys can see that better so the first category is illusionary, psychological manipulation. The second one is self-deceiving, psychological manipulation. Third one, genetic, psychological slash physiological manipulation. And the last one is real spiritual activity. So each of the topics here, each of the subjects here, supernatural things, events, whatever, I categorize them un under these four different categories. And the first three categories here are fake. So I would categorize these as fake happening, fake uh, supernatural events. And the fourth category is real, actual uh, spiritual activity or supernatural events. And I'll categorize each one as uh, I go through them. And then I have this note here that's kind of a reminder. And I'll be kind of repeating this idea throughout the episode that some of these things are only as strong as you are afraid. So in a sense, these subjects kind of feed off your fear. And depending on how how fearful you are of them, that's you kind of psychologically deceive yourself into believing that they're real. And I'm hoping that makes more sense as as we go along. So I'm just going to start at the beginning of this list here. And the first thing is card tricks or sleight of hand. <clears throat> so this is in the territory of magic. Magic in the sense of not like real or quote unquote real magic. I don't think real magic is real. 
and I don't think the card tricks and things like that are real magic either, but it is a form of magic. And I have the definition here of magic. And this is from the Encyclopedia Encyclopedia Britannica, one of my favorite sites to go to for uh, researching any topics. It's better than Wikipedia. And it's the best site that I found. It's the most unbiased, uh, although at times it can be biased. But so the, the definition for magic here, as they say, so magic, a concept used to describe a mode of rationality or way of thinking that looks to invisible forces uh, to influence events, affect change in material conditions, or present the illusion of change. With the Western tradition, this way of thinking is distinct from religious or scientific modes. However, such distinctions and even the definition of magic are subject to wide debate. So, kind of this, this third part right here, present the illusion of change. And there's another definition that I think is even better. And this is the Merriam-Webster definition. Uh, the use of means, such as charms or spells, believed to have supernatural power over natural forces, an extraordinary power or influence seemingly from a supernatural source, something that seems to cast a spell, or the art of producing illusions by sleight of hand. So basically, I've kind of reduced the definition of magic down to anything that any kind of illusion that makes you think that something has changed when it really hasn't or it's kind of like a diversion or um well i've, I've i think of it as a psychological manipulation so for, for things like card tricks when someone does a card trick right and they tell you that something something's happening when it may or may not be happening, right? They say, you know, pick a card, pick any card. They, you, know, you pick a card, you shuffle it. They shuffle it back into the, the card deck, and then they pull it out again. And then it seems like they, some mysterious way, they picked that card that you chose that they didn't know that what the card was, but they still pulled it out of the deck. So that is an illusion. And there is, you know, there's the mechanics behind it. You can look up online how to do a card trick like that and a whole other kinds of card tricks. And that's all psychological manipulation. It's all sleight of hand, meaning that they're doing things in a certain way, has nothing to do with supernatural or the extraordinary. Some people believe that some tricks, some of the more advanced tricks do involve uh supernatural powers so for example if you've heard of the magician david blaine he's a popular one and he there's one trick where he sticks a needle through his hand and all, other kinds of kinds of crazy stuff like that and some people think that he's had that he has actually made uh he actually commands you know, demonic power or something like that um, but it's all advanced trickery and psychological manipulation it's all designed and it's all mechanical meaning that there's a method behind it it's not just let me contact the spirit and then let's do some magic it's actually you got to think about that trick how are you going to trick people into thinking that you're doing something supernatural and you got to perform it the right way if you perform it the wrong way people are going to find out that you're that they're going to find out your method and how you're doing that so and that's why you know magicians say a true magician never gives his secret out because they have to guard these secrets or else their their act is going to fall apart their performance is going to fall apart the entertainment is gone because in order to be entertained by magicians you have to suspend your disbelief you have to think like how did that person do that like how did they make that card disappear or how do they pull a rabbit out of a hat and you, you there's a certain so that it's more entertaining when you're not thinking about how they did it and it's more entertaining when it confuses you 
So the more advanced tricks, so the more advanced the trick is, the more entertaining it is. But it's all mechanical and it's all natural. It has nothing to do with supernatural or extraordinary. All right, so that's the first one out of the way. And I would place that under the category of illusionary psychological manipulation because it's an illusion designed to psychologically manipulate you. It's designed to make you think a certain thing. So for example, it's made to confuse you. It's made you made to th make you think that you're actually seeing something supernatural when in fact you're not. You're just watching someone who has performed a certain, you know, trick for a certain amount of time and now they're able to perform that in a certain way to trick you into thinking that it's supernatural when in reality it's not. It takes a lot of practice and dedication to be a good uh, sleight of hand magician. All right, second category is very similar. So this is psychic uh, readings, palm readings, and fortune telling in general. And I've also lumped in horoscopes. I think horoscopes are very similar uh, to these other other things. So basically, this is you know you walk into a, a fortune telling a shop or whatever a booth that a fortune teller has. Uh, you pay them. They look at your palms, they look at the crystal ball, or any sort of other method like that. And supposedly, now this is what they say, supposedly, they're looking uh, to spirits, they're looking for the spirits to reveal to them something about your future, or something about, you know, a solution to a problem you have, so anything like that. In reality, it's just all general statements that apply to generally a lot of people so uh it's not they're not actually contact they may believe themselves that they have the ability to contact spirits in the in the spiritual realm but something that i think is wrong with that assumption something that disproves that assumption 100 percent, is the fact that as we see in the bible it's not it's not well this is going to sound kind of weird but it's not normal to supernaturally contact spiritual beings what the normal thing is is we see spiritual beings contacting human beings so in the human realm we can't access the spiritual realm but the spiritual realm can access us now this is one of the big things that you know jesus christ has accomplished for those who believe in him and for those you know for the elect is that we have access to the spiritual realm uh and because we have the holy spirit uh given to us and so in that method that's kind of a realm breaking reality that christians do have access to spiritual power because we have the holy spirit but that is far different from what these psychic uh, readers are saying and palm readers and uh and with the horoscopes it's all designed for you to manipulate yourself so for example if you if you read horoscopes i remember i used to read uh, horoscopes i never actually believed it but i thought it was interesting how it did kind of apply uh, so for example I, i'm an aries and so I would read my Aries horoscope and it would say things that, uh, for example, it would say like, you know, Aries is a, a hard headed, stubborn person who speaks their mind and doesn't care who they offend. And uh, they, they don't do anything unless they really want to do it. They don't like being forced to do things, stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, that, that sounds like me. That sounds pretty accurate. And you can kind of trick yourself into believing that the rest of it is true so they, they do get some things right because again these are just general sayings that apply to generally a lot of people and, and there's a lot of um horoscopes uh star signs and things like that it's just all general things and if you read those things and if you say like if, if you read them and then you agree with what they're saying the more you 
believe that what they're saying is true is the deeper you you fall into it so and it doesn't apply to everyone like i can think of people who have the sign aries and who what the horoscopes say don't apply to those people and also there's people who you know they act like an aries but they're not actually an aries so the whole thing falls apart when you actually begin to examine it and so that goes for the the entirety of this of these things here psychic reading palm reading fortune telling it's all again it's very similar to the sleight of hand and the card tricks but it's done in, in a different way there's different practices different methods behind it but they are not actually contacting spiritual beings or you know they're not it's, there's nothing supernatural about it it's all uh, show it's all designed to manipulate you and again these things are only tr as true as you uh, fool yourself uh, okay basically i'm just going to say it. basically fools believe these things are true all right so there it is all right the next one uh seeing heaven or hell seeing god or seeing jesus so this one's kind of a easy one to, to disprove obviously you know if you know anything about the bible um anyone who sees god will not live so anyone who says that they've seen heaven or hell or god or jesus and they are alive to tell about it that is 100 percent not true again it's just straight up disproved by straight up disproved by that just simply that one verse no one may see god and live or no one has seen god and lived i don't remember the exact wording of it but just that that doctrine itself no one has seen god and lived but then we can make the argument well, moses saw god well he saw his back parts you know that's, that's what scripture says that moses that god showed him his back parts he didn't show him in his you know his in his fullness so these people that are saying that they've seen you know they're describing how what god looks like what heaven looks like what jesus looks like so that's just 100 percent incorrect and so what's really funny is that when i was in christian private school they actually had a book about this kid you probably heard about it it's this kid who he was like near death or something or he was dead quote unquote dead for a couple of days or i don't remember exactly what it was but he went to heaven and saw like his relatives there and then when he woke up from whatever problem he was having he was telling everybody they made a book about it he was famous he was talking about it on, on tv shows and stuff like that and they made a lot of money for that family but you know that's not not true at all there's no way that can be true and really there's only two options uh when dealing with things like that because if it's not true well there's only two things it could be one they could be lying or two they're self-deceived they've they have manipulated themselves into believing that what they saw was what they think they saw so that's really what it comes down to either they're lying or they have fooled themselves they have psychologically manipulated themselves and so that i would put that under the category of self-deceiving psychological manipulation and uh, i forgot to mention the palm readings is also self-deceiving these are things that you can trick yourself into believing and something that you can be tricked into believing by someone else so i guess pretty much these two categories here and some another thing about psychologically manipulating is only people who i, I don't mean this as a as an insult or anything but there are people who are very who are very gullible and who will believe a lot of things and who are naive even on spiritual things there's a lot of christians who are naive and they are not guarded they have not guarded themselves from some of these lies and these heresies that are uh spread very quickly in this modern world so that's another thing that you got to keep you got to be aware of is you have to guard yourself and you got to be in scripture like you have to know what scripture actually teaches 
because anyone can come up to you and say, this is what scripture teaches, and they tell you a lie. They tell you a heresy. Well, you got to know what scripture actually teaches so you can know what's a lie and what's not, what's heresy and what's proper doctrine. You got to be Berean, like Paul says. He said that the, he, well, he said um, that he respected that the Bereans were checking everything that Paul was saying. So you got to check everything that you're hearing from these so-called teachers or so-called Christians, professing Christians. And yeah, because this is all manipulation. All right. And now we get into another, uh, another topic here relating to church. And that is a uh, charismatic healing, a really charismatic doctrine in general. But I want to focus on the healings because that is kind of where the spectacle is. That's where the entertainment is. A lot of people, Christian and non-Christian have their, this is in their minds. Basically, this is a, uh, something that, uh, isn't a part of pop culture. So the charismatic healing, you know, the, the casting out demons. And that's kind of also the next category here, fake uh, demon possessions. So with the, and, I, and I've added names here, you know, Benny Hinn, Bill Johnson, you know, you can, Bethel and uh, some of the other televangelists and, and things like that who have a, a doctrine, a improper doctrine on healing. And on the other side of it, they have the doctrine about, uh, you know, exercising demons and uh, some of the, the healings. And uh, Justin Peters does a good job about debunking a lot of that stuff. So I recommend him uh, look up Justin Peters. He has a lot of videos about uh, debunking some of these people who believe that you can heal uh, someone's sickness just by shouting at them, yelling at them, or hitting them. I think Benny Hinn was the guy who would hit people with his jacket. It was either him or another guy. I know there's, there's a couple of them that are popular for doing stuff like that. Or that one dude who said he kicked a woman in the face to heal her or something like that, to remove a demon from her. I don't know. It's a bunch of weird stuff. Again, 100% not true. That is not how any sort of healing is done uh, in the New Testament. And this goes into something else that I believe about the New Testament is all the demon possessions that happened in the New Testament. It, it was a peculiar time for the church because the church was just beginning. Jesus was there and he was setting the ground rules for the church and for the era that would come after, right? For the end times, which is all the time after the ascension of Jesus and all the time before his second coming. So, but when Jesus was on the earth, it was a peculiar time. And I think demon possessions were a peculiar thing for that time. Uh, because demon possessions, I think, are rare. Like real, true demon possessions, they're rare. But there was a lot of them in uh, that time when Jesus was on the earth. So Jesus encountered, encountered a lot of demon possessions. And he was there's a lot of miracles that he was doing. Uh, number one, because he had the power. Number two, because I think demons were allowed to possess people at a higher rate so that Jesus could have opportunities to display his power, to display that he is the son of God and God in the flesh. So that's why I think uh, during the New Testament, that's why that was happening. Because a lot of people will say, Oh, you don't believe in, in miracles? You don't believe in, in exercising demons? Haven't you read the New Testament? Well, yeah, I've read the New Testament. And what these people are doing, what these charlatans are doing, these liars, these deceivers, they're not doing what was happening in the New Testament. Number one, because it's a different time. Number two, the ways that they're doing it is not the same as that Jesus was doing it. The only thing Jesus and the apostles and the disciples had to do was, you know, cast demons out in the name of Jesus. And that was it. The demons left. But you have all these people who are deceiving, uh, th these deceivers that are using methods that they totally make up, has nothing to do with the Bible or the New Testament. And they're coming up with ways just to make a spectacle, just to make a show, to surprise people. And again, they're convincing people who are easily convincible, people who are gullible, people who are not guarding 
their minds and their hearts, people who are not aware of what scripture actually teaches about these things. So again, that's another one. Uh, it's an illusionary psychological manipulation. It's manipulating you to think a certain way and to make you believe that what they're saying is true. So for example, they're saying that they have actual spiritual power to cast out demons and heal people. And they're trying to manipulate people to believe that. So it's all it's all designed to get you to believe that they actually have spiritual power to, to, to do those things. So that's false. And the same thing goes for the fake uh, demon possessions. You know, demon possessions are, are there's a lot of stories about them. I remember when I was younger because I spent so much time on the Internet, I came across the um, the exorcism of Annalise Michelle. That was a famous one. Uh, well, a long time ago, but then more stuff came out about it on the internet and there's documentaries there was a movie about it and other stuff like that and i remember hearing the uh the audio of that exorcism on youtube i was like 13 14 and when you spend a lot of time on the internet especially when you're younger you come across a lot of weird uh, a lot of scary stuff and so the, that was kind of one of the things you know so one of the experiences of having a being on the computer being on the internet watching tv you know I, I even think of it i think of it like you know i had i had four parents right i had my mom my dad but i also had the internet and tv that were also raising me at that time so you know that's just kind of one of those things that that's bound to happen you come across certain things so, uh, so, so I knew about exorcisms and right away I wasn't like freaked out about it for some reason. I thought right away, like that's fake. That's gotta be like a, a movie or something like that. Well, after doing more research on it, uh, later, you know, like years later, uh, it was actually a, a mental illness, I believe. And I believe most people who are quote unquote demon possessed i believe that they are that they have a mental illness and uh so, so okay so well here's my theory on people that think that mental illnesses are people that think someone who's demon possessed is actually demon possessed i think it's a mental illness but i also think uh because some of these people who are quote unquote demon possessed they'll say things like they have a demon inside them or they have a demon afflicting them and uh and things like that and they they have adverse reactions to you know reading the bible and quote unquote the holy water and all the things that the catholics do right because this is a very catholic uh dominated demon possession is dominated by the catholics that with that world of demon possession catholics are the most active in that so but if you take you take someone with a mental illness and you give them the idea that they could possibly have a demon in them and they if they have schizophrenia if they have you know a lot of these times they have a lot of mental illnesses compounded and just like a, a whole stack of mental illnesses so if you were if you were to tell them that hey you might have a demon in you we don't know they're going to take that idea and they're going to run with it and they're going to you know they're going to pretend like that's what they're actually like what what their actual problem is and well they actually believe it but because again they have a mental illness and that creates an effect where well they're they believe they have a demon now because you gave that suggestion to them and now the people who the catholics who want to exercise that demon from you they believe it now then everyone thinks it's true, even though it's all fake. And again, it comes down to because it doesn't look like the way that we see it in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the demons who possess people were more uh, intelligent than the portrayals of demon possession we see today. For example, you have the demon who said, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but I don't know you. 
I mean, we see nothing like that. Not even not, nothing even close to that. Nothing even close to that in the demon possessions that uh, and the things that people are saying are demon possessions, right? You also have the demon that told Jesus, "Send me into the herd of swine." Nothing like that. Um, and just when, when when you look at what happened in the New Testament with demon possessions, and you line that up against what's happening since then, or what what people say are demon possessions, the two are not the same. Okay, so that one I would put under. Uh, it would actually be all three of these, I think. So genetic, psychological manipulation. If somebody has a mental illness where they are delusional, right, and you tell them, you know, you might have a demon in you, well, and then they, and then they delusionally believe that. So I think that's why that's a part of that. And I say it's genetic because most of the time mental illnesses are genetic. So. Uh, that's the reason why I have those three categories there. All right. The next one. Commercials. So commercials are one of those things where, uh, or adver and also advertisements is a part of this. You know, they want, the, the marketing is designed to make you feel, make you think a certain way. And they want you to buy a certain thing or think a certain way about something so they, they want you to think the product is good they want you to think the brand is good and you know they say you got to buy this thing because only the cool people have it or whatever or you know if you're if you're wearing this brand of clothing or this brand of purse or whatever you're going to be one of the cool people so that's all psychological manipulation and it's an illusion because it's a lie because it's deceiving people so that's why i kind of uh I think of commercials as a as a part of some kind of magic because again it's trying to deceive you it's, it's an illusion that's trying to psychologically manipulate you same thing goes for haunted houses when someone thinks a house is haunted um the same thing with, with ghosts and spirits it's all like you can trick yourself into believing that your house is haunted or that there's a ghost or spirit following you uh, and you can make yourself paranoid, you can make yourself delusional, and you can make yourself believe that these things are actually happening to you. So this is one of those things that's a, a self-deceiving psychological manipulation, because you can deceive yourself into believing that these things are happening. I don't think spirits, they don't haunt houses. It is fun to think about. It's fun to watch videos where people are like, there's videos like exploring a haunted house at 3 a.m., those are fun to watch. It's entertaining. It's not true, though. It's not real. Uh, same thing with the ghosts and spirits. Or commanding ghosts and spirits. The, all, all this stuff is not biblical. And that's the reason why I don't believe it. It's just not biblical. And none of these things uh, make me scared. All right? I'm not afraid of these things. But if you are, that kind of makes them stronger. That gives their, their That gives them more power. Or these beliefs more power. Because if you're not afraid, you're just, okay, it's not true, I'm not afraid, whatever. But if you are afraid, then you start building that delusion in your mind. And then you begin to self-deceive yourself. You begin to trick yourself into believing that these things are true. So again, you got to be careful of that. And then uh, astrology. That's another thing uh, similar to the horoscopes and the, the star signs. You trick yourself into believing that it's true because it gives you a general statement and you say hey that's kind of true when in fact it's not 100 percent true they might get some some things right but in the end it's all just like a, a shotgun they're trying to hit as many uh things as possible even though they're missing like a lot of other things <clears throat> all right now we get into the more interesting territory or the territory where I, that i think is a lot more interesting so actually let me let me separate this here all right now i'm going to get into some of the links that i have here so the first one here is golems imaginary friends tulpas and i'm also connecting children and the spiritual realm 
and the children and their supposed connection to the spiritual realm. All right. So I think I have a link here for... All right, I actually don't have a link. I'll just look, quickly look it up. So a golem, if you don't know what a golem is, it comes from it comes from Jewish folklore, Jewish myth, which is basically a... Oh, it's used in the Bible. I don't even know if it's used in the... It's used in the psalm. That's interesting. I didn't know it was used in the psalm. I'm going to look that up real quick. All right, the verses. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. If your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Hmm. It's maybe it's the, the unformed substance. Actually, you know, we can we can look at the Hebrew here. So you guys are watching you watching this live. Um looking at this live. Okay, this is not the one. I don't I can't read Hebrew. I'm not I, I don't know. I was I was studying it before, but I never picked it up that well. I have picked up Greek though. So Greek is I I have better Greek than Hebrew. It's still not a hundred percent provision in Greek, but I can actually read some. Let's look at the interlinear. Right, and it was verse 16, right? Yep, there it is. Galemi. So that's the golem. Unformed substance. Interesting. So I guess that's, that's what the word means then. It means unformed substance. But golem is basically uh, bringing something to life. Bringing an inanimate object to life. So you build something out of rock, you build it out of metal, and you maybe say a prayer or something, and it, it comes alive, basically. So that's what a golem is. So, and, and the the main thing behind that is when uh, you're bringing something to life out of your imagination, so that's the connection with the imaginary friends, which it said to be a tulpa now a tulpa is a spirit or supposedly it's a spirit that you contact with and make friends with from the spiritual realm from the the other realm or whatever so i'm connecting all these things together and the theory behind that is that when you know children report that they have imaginary friends right that's a very common thing for a child to be like yeah, I have an imaginary friend. I'm talking to my imaginary friend or whatever. So the theory behind that is that children, because they're younger, they're and because they're more innocent than older people, they have a stronger connection to the spiritual realm. And so the things, so when they say that they have an imaginary friend, they're actually talking about a spirit that's contacting them through the spiritual realm. And that's called a tulpa. And then, um, because no one else has the same connection as a child does to the spiritual realm, they don't see the imaginary friend or the tulpa, only the, the child sees it. And the child basically conjures up this spirit similar to a golem. And um, so that they conjure up this being that no one else can see but them. So that, that, that's what a tulpa is. Um <clears throat> So this is a, a it's a cool idea. I mean, but again, it's not true. I mean, easily that's not true. Children have a strong imagination. They're not actually conjuring up spirits or conjuring up people. They're not creating their own imaginary friends that are uh, spiritual beings. It's just all it's all in the mind. It's all imagination. And that's really what all these things are about. It's about your mind and how easily how how easy it is for your mind to be swayed and how easy it is for your mind to be manipulated i mean i don't want to make this episode about the government but 
the government does a really good job at manipulating people's minds and that just shows how the the mind is so hard to keep in one place it's so hard to stabilize it in one spot and that's why you know scripture often repeats in particular in the new testament in the letters of paul you know be sober-minded you have to be sober-minded you can't lose your your ground you can't lose your perception of reality and what what reality actually is which the bible accurately describes what reality is so you can't lose that for one second because if you do you're giving all these all these thoughts and all these ideas you're giving them power because you could believe them if your guard is not up so you, you got to be careful and then once you know if you believe one of these things is true and that it's actually what it what it says it is that creates like a domino effect then well if that's true then well this can be true and then what about this over here and this over here and then all of a sudden you're replacing you're replacing all the truth you're replacing scripture with all these false false things and all these lies and in the end it's not good so again you got to be careful so i think this is a cool idea it would be cool for a movie which um i think there's a there's actually an x an x files episode about you know children having psychic powers you know that's an interesting thing there's also a kind of a, a myth that the government was doing experiments on children uh, trying to harness their psychic powers i forgot what it's called but it's i mean i don't think that they actually did that the government has done some weird experiments i don't know if they're they're experimenting on children for their psychic energy i, I don't think so but interesting concept interesting idea not true all right now the next one is another interesting thing and i think i actually have a link for that so this is talismans amulets relics and artifacts and i'm also have here i also have here in parentheses the roman catholic church and saintology or the, the doctrine of the saints that the catholic church have the catholic church has and that the eastern orthodox church has so i'm kind of grouping all these together um, i do have a link here so an amulet or a talisman or and i'm also because i'm grouping in sacred objects here uh amulet also called talisman an object either natural or man-made believed to be endowed with special powers to protect or bring good fortune so think of it as like a lucky charm amulets are carried on the person or kept in the place that is the desired sphere of influence uh, for example on a roof or in the field the terms amulet and talisman are often used interchangeably but a talisman is sometimes defined as an engraved amulet <coughs> so and then, yep, down here it even mentions in the Middle Ages, Christian amulets included the traditional relics of saints and letters said to have been sent from heaven. Among Jews, the preparation of amulets became a rabbinic function. Muslims today often carry verses from the Quran, the names of God, or associated sacred numbers within small satchels. Christians may wear crosses or crucifixes, and uh, statuettes of the Madonna are found in some Roman Catholic households. A popular type of amulet is the good luck charm, such as the birthstone or rabbit's foot so this is one that um is interesting because the well they, they mentioned catholics they mentioned jews they mentioned muslims they mentioned uh some modern protestant you know christians uh carrying the crosses so it's a wide widespread belief in in like an object having spiritual power or having spiritual significance you know i'm I'm a Christian who I don't wear crosses. I don't believe that, you know, having a cross necklace. I, okay, well, I, I don't think it's bad, but I don't think there's any use to it. So I don't do it. And I don't tell people to do it. I, I don't think there's any, any power behind that. There's no power behind the physical image of a cross or of a saint. 
you know, as a, as Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox do, they believe that there's actual power and significance behind uh, the the pictures and the statues of saints and the objects that they say came uh, from saints. So, for example, you know, they have Saint Peter's tooth or whatever, and if you want to heal your teeth or gum disease, you go to Saint Peter's tooth or or whatever there's a lot of different ways that they do stuff like that and they're just trying to make money you know pay money to visit the the museum of saints teeth or whatever there's a lot of different things like that in the roman catholic world and in the eastern orthodox world so you know they have either deceived themselves to believe that this is true or they they're lying and they know that they're lying but at the end of the day i don't believe it the bible doesn't show anything like this now if you want to make the argument well you know moses's staff had some you know it was a physical object that had some spiritual significance had some spiritual power all right, sure, but it wasn't the staff. It was God who gave Moses that power. It, it was God was the one doing it. Not it, the power wasn't imbued in the staff. <clears throat> it was God working through Moses. So, so that's that one. Um, yeah, there's, there's no power in physical objects. And oh, I guess quick note. And I think this goes both ways. So if you want to say like, oh, don't touch that thing. It has, it gives you bad luck or it has satanic power in it. Quote unquote, satanic power. I think it goes both ways. There's no physical object that can have, you know, positive spiritual power or negative spiritual power. I, I just don't think that's how the world works. And I also don't think spirits can go into physical objects or possess physical objects like dolls or or things like that uh so that's similar to you know spirits haunting houses i don't think they're gonna be uh demonic or a demon possessing a doll or anything like that that's like it's fiction it's just whatever it's not true so and again the people that do believe that uh, physical objects can have spiritual power they have deceived themselves. They've been deceived by other people. They're being psychologically manipulated. And that psychological manipulation can run very, very deep. You know, there's lots of Catholics who are really stubborn in their their belief about physical objects. And in their belief about uh, pictures and things like that. Pictures of Jesus, pictures of Mary. Um, <clears throat> so that's... It's, it's kind of sad in that way too i mean it, it's not true but it's sad that people think it's true because it really does take uh its roots go deep in you know like tradition and and history and uh in families so it runs really deep this belief in physical objects having spiritual power okay <clears throat> next one ley lines if you hadn't if you haven't heard of ley lines it's basically when you take one location on a map and you draw a straight line across from it to another location on a map and then you draw a straight line from that to another location on the map so you have different locations you draw a straight line between all the different locations on a map and it creates a shape or it creates like a, a letter or a word or something. And then the way that comes into play is if you are walking through any of those lines or if you're living in one of those lines, that is a line of uh, like spiritual power. Or th there's something weird about that line between the different places. Normally, it's uh, what they call sacred sites or historical monuments, things like that. 
and when you draw a straight line from each of them on a map it'll create some shape and if you happen to be within the shape or on one of the lines weird stuff happens so sometimes uh, some unexplained events happen in a particular area and, and and some people say whoa it's right in the middle of this ley line or it's right in the middle of this shape that's created by the different things and it's one of those things where it's just coincidence and people come up with a theory for why there are so many coincidences in a particular place and so they so that's what this ley line theory is for and again because uh, coincidence is a very strong thing that can make people believe that uh, something is so something that's happening that isn't happening and again the mind is easily tricked by patterns so our minds we were created to recognize patterns but we can also let the patterns trick what we believe so this is one of those things that's like that ley lines um <clears throat> so I, I don't think it's true again nothing not, nothing like that in the bible i don't think it's true i think it's interesting to look up some of the stuff and it's kind of good to or it's not good but i mean it's fun to kind of waste a, waste a little bit of time looking at some of those things uh for example that you take all the mcdonald's in a certain area draw a straight line between them and it makes a you know the golden arches the m or whatever but that's just a fun one it's not true uh sometimes there are coincidences that, that are funny but it's just that coincidences that are funny but uh right the next one another fun one homunculus uh similar to the golem um uh, actually i should have added it in with the rest of these up here but a homunculus is pretty much a um i think i have a link on that uh actually don't okay well a homunculus is uh basically when you create a small man so this is not talking about children when you you know when a child is is born uh, this is talking about when you create a full adult uh being human uh for for whatever like as your servant or whatever <clears throat> So th this comes from um, fiction, and it's an old myth. It's a very old myth that uh, magicians could do this. Wizards could create people out of nothing. and Or sometimes there are things involved, like there's some spells where you can create a homunculus. Like you need, you need a rabbit's foot, you need leaves, you need whatever, cinnamon sticks, put it all together. You got a, a a human or whatever and there's also videos online where they try to make their own homunculus it's all fake it's all puppets and stuff like that and i mean if you think that's true like you got to be really dumb to believe that's true but this is one of those things it's like totally not true bible 100 percent disproves it you cannot create there's only one way to create life okay that's when a man and a woman create life there's no other way to create a human being other than that okay you can't clone a human you can't make a human come from nothing only that that's the, the power that only god has and humans are not god even though they wish they were and they try to be with science and technology and, and the progress that humans want you know the uh, we want to evolve to the next stage, right? For those that believe in evolution, I don't. And I hope that's obvious that I don't believe in evolution, but we will. We don't have that power <clears throat> to create life from nothing. We don't have that power. And, you know, it's kind of a fun idea. It's interesting. There are some books out there that tell you how to create a homunculus but it's not true but what is interesting is i heard someone redefine what a homunculus means and i was listening to the the my family thinks i'm crazy podcast i recommend it if you want to hear a podcast about uh weird stuff supernatural magic stuff occult um they're not christian so they believe a lot of different 
weird things. But one thing that one of the guys said on there was that uh, celebrities are homunculuses because they're human beings that are quote unquote created for a certain purpose. So, for example, they're like some of the child actors and actresses, you know, they're taken from a very young age. They're, they put them in movies and they get popular. And as they grow up, they never leave Hollywood. They never leave that spotlight. So they were pretty much created for like the only purpose they were created or that they were uh, like the, the only purpose they serve is for the purpose of Hollywood and for the purpose of whoever owns them. So I think that's an interesting uh, definition of homunculus that is kind of someone who's someone who you direct in a certain way or someone who's directed in a certain way, similar to uh, some actors in Hollywood and things like that. So that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. But in the original definition of homunculus, this it's not true. All right. Next thing, uh, white and black magic. Uh, so this is. And I'm, I guess I should group this with the next one. Uh, magic with a K as, defi as defined by Aleister Crowley. So basically, Aleister Crowley um, studied a lot of quote-unquote magic and occultism. And he even started his own cult. And he was in the, like what, the late 18... Early 1800s, maybe late 1700s. I don't actually let me look it up right now. I think I, yeah, I actually do have a, yeah, late 1800s, so 1875 to 1947. A British occultist, writer, mountaineer who was a practitioner of magic, as he spelled it, called himself the Beast 666. Okay, very funny. He was denounced in his own time for his decadent lifestyle and had a few followers, but he became a cult figure after his death. So he wasn't popular until after he died. Um, and he's kind of seen as this figurehead of uh, Satanism, even though he wasn't uh, satanic or, or in, in, the, in the definition of sat satanic. But he was uh, deep in the occult. And occult practices. But. So the thing about him is how he defined magic. So. And he added a K to it. Because he was separating it from. Uh, the other kind of magic. Without a K. Which he viewed as just tricks. Like card tricks. Things like that. And he was talking about. Or he, he was studying like real. The real magic. The real stuff. Where you contact spirits. And they help you out with stuff. And then you. Uh, command reality in a certain way to get certain things done so that's magic with a k and so black and white magic is that kind of magic that's like this is the real magic where we command spirits and spells and curses and stuff like that that's not uh true you know and they say white magic is selfless and black magic is selfish that's how it's normally defined but it, it's not real. You can't curse someone. And you can't bless someone through magic. That's It's just not a thing that you can do. So sometimes uh, I think especially during the 80s and the 90s there was Christians who were they were made aware of the satanic pop culture which is still going on today you know there's satanic satanic imagery in movies and music videos and things like that and music um so the, the theory is that well these people to make themselves successful they have to please satan um and this actually goes into you know satanism which i think i do have on here uh well, i should have it on here but i guess Okay, I actually don't have Satanism, Satanism on here. I should, though. Um, so I guess I'll just talk about it now. But the, the fake Satanism, 
that's a, a part of pop culture. It's been a part of pop culture for a long time. Uh, Christians are kind of afraid of it because they think it actually has power. I'm one of those Christians that I don't think it has power. And I kind of side with uh, Walter Martin, if you're familiar with him. He was a Christian who was uh, kind of in that realm of the occult. Like he was in, he was speaking against the occult and other practices like that, witchcraft. And he was giving uh, scripture against those things. And one of the things that he kind of repeated a lot was that we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of these things because it has no power compared to, you know, the power that we have in Christ. And the power that Christ has in protecting us from these things. So <clears throat> I think he believed that the satanic things had power and that this magic actually had influence in, in the real world. I don't think it does, though. The reason I don't think it does is because they're only as strong as you fear it. So going back to that, to the this quote that I have here, it's only as strong as you are afraid. If you are afraid of Satan and, you know, the satanic imagery, you will start to create a delusion in your mind where you believe that it actually has power over you and that it is actually influencing you and harming you spiritually. So my view of it is, well, number one, it's stupid because why would you want to worship Satan when you can worship the living God, you know, which is, that's where it, <laughs> it's hard to put it in words because it's so simple. Like, so, that, that, so that's one thing about, you know, Satan, Satanism. Uh, and the second thing. I don't think it has power. I don't think Satan has enough power. Uh, Satan is a, he is confined to, uh, you know, he, he walks around the earth. He can't be everywhere at once. So, I mean, right there, he's not as strong as, you know, God or, or Christ. And Satan also doesn't know the future uh, because we know the angels can't know the future. You know, they were just as uh, surprised from Jesus as uh, humans were. So Satan is a fallen angel. So he doesn't have access to the future. He doesn't have access to telling you the future or knowing uh, what's going to happen. And he's easy to defeat. We saw Jesus defeat him by quoting scripture at him. So he's not not as strong as some of these people make him out to be so i think the and just satan is only as strong as you are afraid of him in the sense that if you truly believe that he has power and influence over you and that he has his his demons you know out there trying to trying to get you that makes you paranoid and that brings the delusion that you are being oppressed or being attacked by satan or his demons Right, and then we get these Christians who they always say, "Satan's afflicting me. Satan's afflicting me. His demons are afflicting me." Uh, you know, I'm fighting demons every day. I'm fighting Satan, Satan every day. <clears throat> That's not true. I think we give Satan way too much credit on on stuff like that. You know, we fight ourselves more than we fight Satan or demons. So I think we need to stop saying we need to stop blaming Satan for these things, and people need to stop blaming demons uh, for these things and start blaming ourselves because we are the problem, not Satan and not his demons. So these things only have as much power as you give it. They're only as strong as you are afraid. If you're not afraid, they're not, they're, they're not strong. They don't have power. And so, and it's not true. Like it's not. Okay. So, so white and black magic doesn't exist. The magic that Crowley was talking about does not exist. Uh, Satan does exist, but he doesn't have the power that some of these people are saying that he has. Demons, they exist. But again, I don't think they're possessing people in the same way that they were when Jesus was on the earth. I think God was allowing demons to possess people so that Jesus could demonstrate that he was, you know, the son of God and God. And he had uh, the, the, the fullness of 
of God dwelling in him. So I, I don't think the the, lands, the spiritual landscape is not as infested with demons as it was in that particular time. So I don't I think nine times out of ten, or I'll say nine point five times out of ten, all the demon possessions that you hear about are not true. And all the um and all the things that go along with that. It's not it's just not true. <clears throat> all right. Occultism. Okay. Very similar to magic and, and things like that. And here we're going to uh, Gaia.com. What is occultism? What does occult mean? Yeah, okay. So I'll just read. Uh, in decades past, the word occult dealt with anything that was outside of natural thinking. It was a generic term that incorporated almost everything that we now view to be part of the non-traditional spiritual frontier. When I was a kid, my first stop in our public library was always to the books shelved in the 130 section as defined by the Dewey Decimal System. It was the paranormal and occult category. Uh, there were books on astrology, divination, which included tarot and the I Ching, uh, cartomancy, or telling fortunes with regular playing cards, palmistry, numerology, phrenology, crystal gazing, clairvoyance, clairaudience, automatic writing, and tea leaf reading. <laughs> Which, all those things are false. It's all self-deception and illusions to deceive other people. But, um, so let's see. The, okay, they actually don't get to the definition of a cult. But it includes a lot of things. And basically the occult is like finding things that are hidden. Things that are kept away from uh, the general population. Things that are hidden behind. That Things like that, that people try to suppress. And that's what they say about you know, the church. They say the church is suppressing these things because this is where the real power is at. So it, it's one of those things again... It's just a lie. It's just there to, for you to, to deceive yourself and deceive other people. So occultism, it might look scary and it might sound scary. and But it's just not. It doesn't have any power if you're not afraid of it. Right, the next one, alchemy and metallurgy. Uh, I think I have... Okay, the philo I know the Philosopher's Stone is related to alchemy, but I don't think I actually have the alchemy uh, definition here. So we'll just go with the Philosopher's Stone. So, okay, well, here they have it right here. Alchemy. A form of speculative thought that, among other aims, try to transform base metals such as lead or copper into silver or gold and to discover a cure for a disease and a way of extending life. So basically, it's the practice of trying to create gold out of different, uh, out of other materials, out of other elements. And the reason they wanted to do that was to get rich. If you could collect a bunch of cheap copper and silver, well, in comparison to gold, it was relatively cheaper. But if you get a bunch of that, make it all into gold, you'll be rich. Basically, a get-rich-quick scheme. Uh, also, there was something called the Philosopher's Stone. You might have heard of this, but this was a specific kind of material that uh, they believed could transform... Um, yeah, sought by alchemists for its supposed ability to transform base metals into precious ones, especially gold and silver. So you can take a, a a lower kind of element and transform it into gold and silver. Uh, and they also believed that it contained the elixir of life or that the elixir of life could be taken from the Philosopher's Stone. So it's a myth and... I mean, it looks like nobody found it because we don't have that ability to live forever or extend life. 
uh, we don't have the ability to make whatever element we want into gold. So it's not it's not true. Uh, even though there are you know some theories, some conspiracies that you know this supposed person has the elixir to life, or this person found it. You know, uh, I think you know uh, George Soros had like eight heart surgeries. He's, he's still alive. Maybe he's got the elixir of life. He's got the philosopher's stone. I don't know. It's not true. It's just myth. It's just, um, it's just a, a fairy tale. Alchemy and metallurgy is real. Like you can actually make different elements with other elements, but you're not going to make gold out of whatever element you want. You're not going to make uh, something better by combining two elements. I mean, you, you can make things for different uses. Like if you're making, um, if you want to make something out of metal, but you don't want to make it out of one kind of metal, you got to mix it in with another metal. So it's cheaper to make, you know, you can do things like that and things have been done like that. And that's the way people are doing. So that's like the real, uh, metallurgy and alchemy, but the, the whole other side to it, the whole, uh, the whole hidden side to it is, is not real. All right. Pagan symbology. Uh, this is another interesting one that there's a lot of things out there that are derived from pagan symbology. And I don't have a link for this one. I thought I did. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna look it up. I can, I can go off the cuff with this one. So basically, it's just old symbols that were used in ancient uh, and not even that age ancient religions or, you know, non-Christian religions. And they would use these symbols to represent certain things. And now people are using them now <clears throat> well, for different purposes. But one of the purposes, they believe that it actually has power. So, for example, with the pentagram... You draw a star and then a circle around it, or you flip it upside down and you get the goat's head, which is a satanic symbol. Uh, and you know, and it's said to have power. And then you have the common, like if you want to conjure a spirit, you draw a pentagram on the floor and you put a candle on each point. You chant a, a spell or whatever, and you summon a demon. Um, but so there's a lot of pagan symbology, like just everywhere. Because it's become a part of culture, a part of pop culture. So it's, it's kind of hard to escape it. And you can look at uh, subliminal messaging in, in uh, logos, like brand logos, corporate logos. And they're kind of taking these symbols from pagan and from other sources. And they're putting them in their logos. Whether they know they're doing that or not. I don't know, but you can find those things out there. For example, the Target logo, you know, some people say that's derived from uh, a pagan symbol or the, the swirl. Um, I thought I did have, a, I had a, a site here. I'm actually going to look for it again. Because I had a lot of examples about that. Yeah, I did have one. Yeah, so the pentacle or the pentagram, there's that star and it you know, represents different things. Um, so it's said to have power. The eye of Horus, same thing, an Egyptian symbol. Thor's hammer. You have the Om symbol from uh, Eastern, Eastern religions, Hinduism. Right, and it stands for a certain thing and it has power in it, whatever. The horn of Odin. Uh, and here's the pentagram. Uh, and, I, and it's yeah, it's not inherently a satanic symbol. It's just a symbol for uh, basically, I think, a lot, a lot of different things. But it symbolizes, yeah, the four elements of life, air, fire, water, earth, accompanied by a fifth, the human spirit. Or the, the triple moon, 
which actually the moon is a symbol for goddess. If you and if you've seen uh, some pictures of Mary, right, Mary, the mother of Jesus, there's pictures, there's statues, and they have the moon at her feet, or they have the moon somewhere. Uh, so that's a pagan symbol, and you know they're trying to synthesize pagan symbolism with quote unquote Christian symbolism. I don't think Christians should have uh, symbols or physical objects attached to it. The, I'm not saying that the cross is bad. I'm not saying that you can draw a picture and say, you know, this this is Jesus. This is a picture of Jesus being tempted by Satan. I'm not saying you can't do that. What I am against is statues. Um, for example, you have a statue of Jesus, and if you place spiritual significance to it, that that's where it becomes a problem. Uh, also, speaking about statues, and now that, that we're we're in the Christmas time, uh, nativity sets, you know, the little figurines of baby Jesus and everything. That's fine if you want to do that in your home not 100 percent for that having that in a church especially you know by the pulpit um i don't think anything should be next to the the pulpit at the front anything that doesn't need to be there so that's a whole other side but uh, just to bring that up because it does have some connection to this um but but anyway any, anything anything physical representing a biblical character and that's given spiritual significance i think that's heresy i think that's wrong but um yes you do have the the moon symbol here uh the horned god uh the ankh another egyptian symbol uh a corn doll the labyrinth the seven pointed star uh, I'm not sure what that is. The swastika. This is another fun one. Yes, this was a Hindu symbol meaning peace. And, you know, if you put it on a certain thing, it means that your house is blessed with peace or your whatever is blessed with peace. So, now, I don't believe it actually does that, right? And then, of course, the Nazis took this symbol. Uh, they flipped it, I believe, I believe they flipped it. No, they actually... Uh, I don't know. Sometimes it's the other way. Sometimes it's a different way. Sometimes there's you'll see dots. They'll add dots to it. So there's different ways that it shows up. But... <clears throat> um, so... Also the... The Ouroboros. Or the Infinity Snake. Another Egyptian symbol, yin yang, Eastern symbol. Uh, it's about the duality of man, right? Nature and all existence itself. Uh, comes from Taoism. The sun wheel. The spiral. Symbol of the goddess. I'm not sure which one, but whatever. A whole lot of symbols that you might see pop up here and there and it's just all it again it only has the power that you give it and it really doesn't have power it just comes down to your imagination for example if i had a symbol in if i, if I had like a symbol of protection on a necklace or something and i wore it and you know i was like if I was protected from a car crash and I said, wow, my neck, my necklace saved me. It's, it's all because of this necklace is, it must be real. It's got real power behind it. That's all in my mind. I'm giving, I'm giving that thing power because I'm imagining it and I'm self deceiving myself. I'm psychologically manipulating myself to believe that. So these things, they don't have any, any power, any spiritual significance. Now that doesn't mean you can adopt these pagan symbols and start wearing them all over yourself. That's just stupid because we shouldn't have anything to do with those things. So, uh, even though it might not have power behind it, the fact that you, okay, well, associating with it, 
is dumb. One, it's useless. Two, it's anti-biblical. It's not biblical. Those things that it represents are not biblical and not uh, Christian. <laughs> All right, the next one, Hermeticism. And I do have a link for that. So Hermeticism is secret knowledge, an ancient secret doctrine that dates back to early Egypt and its innermost knowledge has always been passed on only orally. In each generation, there have been some faithful souls in different countries of the world who received the light, carefully cultivated it, and did not allow it to be extinguished. Thanks to these strong hearts, these fearless spirits, truth has not been lost. It was always passed on from master to disciple, from adept to neophyte, from mouth to ear. Uh, the terms hermetically sealed, hermetically locked, and so on derived from the tradition and indicate that the general public does not have access to these teachings. So this comes uh, kind of like an Eastern thing to it. Because what you'll, what you'll see in Eastern religions and Eastern philosophy is hidden, something hidden knowledge. Which is interesting because in the New Testament, you'll hear that uh, what was hidden is now revealed in Christ. Or something to that effect, something like that. So kind of in contrary to that Eastern thought process of that there's a hidden knowledge, there's something hidden out there that only a few select people are able to possess. So <clears throat> so Hermeticism is that hidden, that hidden knowledge. Um, even the theory of these teachings is rarely found in books. And if so, then only veiled. Kybalion is one of the most knowledgeable books. The term Hermeticism is related to Hermes, Trismegistos. Hermes is the patron of the esoteric tradition. So there's that word esoteric. It uh, refers to the same thing, hidden knowledge. Hermes is considered the messenger of the gods and guardian of the primal knowledge. The well-known seven hermetic principles originate from him. So this is what Hermeticism is. The, princi the principle of mentality, the principle of equivalence, the principle of vibration, of polarity, of rhythm, of cause and effect and of uh, that word so the, that's what hermeticism is all about and what the principle means uh, is different from every person or every teacher of hermetic every learner of hermeticism uh, so, so what they mean exactly is different but this is basically the groundwork for it um, and it's related to new age and new thought uh, which uh, I have a link here <clears throat> so and I'll just read this and then I'll explain how it's related new thought a mind healing movement based on religious and metaphysical presuppositions that originated in the United States in the 19th century the great diversity of views and styles of life represented in various new thought groups makes it virtually impossible to determine the number of the movement's members or adherents. The influence of the various new thought groups has been spread by its leaders through lectures, journals, uh, okay, whatever, it's not. Uh, the origin, teachings, it's a whole combination of a lot of different things. Uh, but it does have a huge Eastern religious influence. So right here they say it from Hinduism. Uh, Taoism, um, Eastern philosophy. So uh, basically, New Thought and New Age is all about um, basically controlling your reality with your mind and how you can command reality by uh, just by your divine power that humans have divine power right they say it right here the divine nature of humanity that we all have a piece of god within all of us and that's where you get that belief that uh we are all a part of the same consciousness we are all god we're all gods and and we we can command our reality so one of the things uh, of, with like the, the law of attraction for example um <clears throat> It's a new thought, spiritual belief that positive or negative thoughts bring positive or negative experiences into a person's life. So because you have the divine power, depending on what you're thinking, that will manifest itself in reality. It's all, it's all lies. It's all bogus, you know, and again, 
you can trick yourself into believing this because people will think, oh, something bad happened to me. That's because I am thinking negatively too much or something good happened to me. That means I'm doing a good job and thinking of positive things all the time. So it, it's all about, uh, so it's not really, I think it shows that the mind has power, not divine power, but it shows that you can trick yourself into believing these things because again, the mind is so easily tricked and easily deceived that these things are, are, you know, they can implant themselves into your mind. They can take root and they can become stronger because you are falling into this, into that trap of believing that it's, it's real and that, that you have this kind of divine power when in fact you don't, you're just tricking yourself. You know, it's the imagination. That, that's what it comes down to. All right, shamanism. Um, I'm going to try to move through these a little bit quick, uh, more quickly. I actually don't have a link for that. But basically, shamanism is where you have uh, one person, you know, for, ex oh, for example, like a shaman, someone who has contact with the spiritual realm. And you go to them and you can and you can uh, talk to them to figure out some things and they'll contact the spirits and they'll get back to you with an answer. But basically shamanism is the belief that you can interact with the spiritual realm. Again, we, you can't do that. There's only one way to contact the spiritual realm, if you want to put it like that, and that's through prayer. And that's not even the same thing that shamanism is. But, you know, that's our only access to God in, in that sense. Um, so shamanism is totally not true. You, you can't contact spirits and they can't tell you things. But what often happens is you get this person who calls himself a shaman. They say they contact spirits and then they hear... Uh, the spirits, quote unquote, getting back to them. Uh, for example, they'll sit there and meditate, and they'll be like, "Okay, I'm listening for for spirits." Uh, first thought that pops into their mind that's the supposed spirit. So it's all just tricking themselves again. That's really what all these things come down to. The next one: astral projection and out of body experiences or lucid dreaming. Uh, Another thing that's just has to do with your mind and it has to do with uh, your physiology and your sensations. So uh, you can kind of command your body to quote unquote, or you can kind of command yourself to quote unquote, leave your body. Really all, all it is, is just, again, the imagination and putting yourself in that state uh, between being awake and asleep which I've been able to do that uh, sometimes. So basically what you do is <clears throat> you're lying in bed. You let your body shut off and then, but you want to keep your brain awake. So your body shuts off, your brain's awake. Eventually you'll fall asleep. Your brain will fall asleep, but there's one part of your brain that's awake. And so you'll enter the dream state where you're dreaming. Um, but you have full control of yourself in your dream. So I've been able to do that on, on some occasions. And this is also related to sleep paralysis where your body's asleep, but your brain's awake. You know, you can, your eyes are open and but you can't move because your body's asleep. That, so that happens to me sometimes too. Um, and then how to project yourself out of your body. You basically just imagine you, flying through your house you know which i've done that and it's not it's not like my spirit leaving my body it's just a dream that i'm having i'm just imagining it so again the, that's, that's that's the power of imagination uh, and then i also attach to this depersonaliz depersonalization and derealization which i've also uh, feel sometimes which is basically a feeling that you're watching yourself from outside um, or like 
nothing feels real and you feel like you're you feel like you're in a dream you feel like you have full control of your body but in a dream state so i've gotten that a few times uh i still do it's not often but it is something that happens uh and the last thing here is alien abduction again who knows what's going on with the people who say that they've been abducted by aliens I don't think aliens exist. So when if someone says that they're abducted by aliens, who knows what it could be? It could be drugs. It could be, again, a dream, an imagination. It could be a lot of different things. It is fun to read about, you know, stories that people have about being abducted by aliens. Um, you know, they'll say, like, they were sleeping one time. They woke up. They see a bright light come towards them. And then they see bodies, uh hovering over them and kind of touching them touching you and so it's all imagination it's all dreaming it's all um just the mind playing tricks on itself uh, because again the, the mind is a th the mind is the thing that's easily led by other things so if you're not careful you can be influenced to think certain things and it's all psycholo psychological manipulation. It's not actual spiritual beings messing with you or anything. It's just, it's, it's all in your mind, basically. And then <clears throat> I have here what I consider to be genetic, psychological, or physiological manipulation. So schizophrenia, some forms of autism, uh, Tourette's, delusions bipolar and multiple personality disorder and OCD obsessive compulsive disorder all these things it's in the mind and the way people get these mental illnesses is of course through genetics and it doesn't mean that they're true like if so if you have schizophrenia and you imagine voices in your head you imagine someone telling you to kill yourself which is often what happens with people with schizophrenia they hear voices that tell them uh, like you're worthless, you're nothing. You should just kill yourself. Jump out the window. That's it's not real. It's not there. And you can easily say like, oh, that's obviously demon possession. There's demons talking to these people that have schizophrenia, but that's not it. That's not what that is. It's a it, again, it's your mind. It all comes back to the mind. Same thing with uh, Tourette's. You know, people they they have the physiological need to yell something. And it's just the mind is wired in a certain way that you have to say this thing right now. And, you know, it's different things. Uh, for Depends on, depending on the person. Uh, bipolar and multiple, multiple personality. Same thing. It's not actually multiple people in you. It's just you and uh, the way that, that their minds operate. Same thing with OCD. Again, um, it's just the, the mind. <clears throat> and it really, I think it's delusion. I think a lot of these is delusion. You're imagining things that aren't there. So with, with bipolar and multiple, multiple personality, you're delusional that you have multiple personalities, right? And that's really hard to treat. That's really hard to untangle that mess. I don't even know how to do that. Same thing with OCD you're delusional because you think these objects have to be aligned in a certain way. I've, I've seen documentaries on uh, these different illnesses and just the way people act. Like for example, with OCD, the way someone acts when their shoes aren't in the right place, they just freak out and they have a meltdown. And it's like, wow, these people have a serious problem. And it's all because of the, the way that the mind, the way that their brains are wired. <clears throat> and that's all because of uh, genetics. And then the last category here, which is real, real, uh, the, the real deal. Like this is the real satanic stuff, the real demonic possessions, the real demonic magic, uh, biblical demonology and Satan. And it's all the stuff you find in the Bible but the question is does it happen now is it happening now i don't know 
all the things that I've seen about demon possession and the events, uh, you know, people, the stories about people getting possessed by demons, I haven't seen one that I actually believe. And, you know, I'm not saying I don't believe that it's possible. I, I, of course, it's possible because we've seen it happen in the New Testament, but I don't think that it's actually happening, uh, you know, to the same degree that it is or that it was in the New Testament because it was happening a lot in the New Testament. <clears throat> but it's just not in the same frequency now. So and I, I've never seen, you know, dem real demon possessions or real demonic magic. So this is more like a hypothetical thing. I'm sure it's out there, but it looks a lot different than the fake demon possessions and the real healings looks a lot different than what you're seeing from these popular charismatic teachers. So that, that's why I have this category here because I know it's true. I know it does happen. I know it can happen. It's somewhere out there. It's happening. But I've just I just never seen it, so that's my that's my take on it. All right, so we got through it. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I hope you enjoyed having something to look at. I know this is kind of a long episode, but a lot of stuff uh, to cover, a lot of stuff to talk about. Let me know if you want me to go back and look at one of these in more detail. Uh, just let me know and I would be happy to do that. I'm planning on going through some of these in later episodes, uh, going through them in more detail. But for now, you know, we'll, we'll just see what happens. I'm still trying to come up with a name for the show. Uh, if you have any thoughts, let me know. And eventually I'll get this up on Spotify so you guys can listen to it there. And hopefully we'll get more listeners and stuff like that. But I gotta go. I'll see you guys in the next one. Listen, I am not nice, I am not kind, and I am not wonderful.